Hi, YouTube. Hi, YouTube. We're here. Hi. Make sure you like, subscribe, comment, turn on your notifications. We waited a little bit later because the college football playoff is finally here, baby. Enjoy the show. Uh, I don't think we have to do anything uh, funny or in charming or anything at the top. I think we've got plenty to talk about. We can just go right into it. Well, I, I do think that you should, you should own up to what has happened, I believe. Are you, you're just going to be like everybody else? Yeah, no, I don't no, no. Think... no, and I and well, I, I, I got a question. First of all, I I do have some things to say about that. But what is own up to? To I didn't I didn't I didn't hurt anybody. I didn't kill anybody. I was wrong about a football game. You're right. No, no, no. Maybe own up was strong. I want to say though that I you know we we've talked about Kelly Keegs putting um, a spell on you now for the last few weeks. I truly believe that it's real. And Jack, I don't know. You could probably remember better than I can because you're you pay more attention to me than I pay attention to myself. I don't know exactly when I said I had this weird feeling that Alabama is going to beat Georgia because there's no way Georgia is going to go undefeated. And I believe it had to have lined up around the time that Brandon got a hex put on him. It had to have. No, you were saying it for a while. I would say <laughs> Casey gave a lot of credit to like, it was like credit where it's credits due, but her two big takes throughout the season where Bama, it's going to beat Georgia and Michigan. And, I mean, that's one, two. So we might as well get into it. Well, we got to actually start the show, boys and girls. That's why I transitioned. I transitioned. Yeah, right. And I, I know, Brandon, that you're not a big person about making sure everybody knows when you're right about things. So I, right. I really don't want to do it to you. Um, but what Jack just said is incredibly accurate. Okay. So – we're three minutes in, already stroking Casey's ego as hard as we can. So if y'all want to do a podcast. I like Katie's face. Katie's like, come on, really? This podcast is made to stroke yours, Brandon. No, it's not. Yes, it is. You I'm stroke hard. your own ego all the time. That's I don't you find that clip. Find that clip of when I stroke my own ego. I'm sorry. You're in Can we start the podcast? <laughs> Hi, welcome to Unnecessary Roughness Barstools, college football podcast brought to you by the great folks and the delicious drinks of High Noon Hard Seltzer. High Noon Sunsets are the best on the market. There's a lot of seltzers on the market. It's been a seltzer rich game for a while, but High Noon came out of there like a storm and has taken over. They are the best. They got great flavors like the grapefruit and the peach and the black cherry and the passion fruit and the mango and the watermelon and the lime and I'm missing one, but those are your great flavors. High noon, perfect for a college football Saturday. I was watching the Big Ten Championship last night at a Michigan bar in the West Village, and there were more high noons than any other drink, like, in the entire crowd, and it was just a beautiful sight. It really was. You know, normally you see it, at, it's like, it's a more of like a pub style place. It's like, oh, you see darker beers or whatever. No, no, no. These Michigan fans were pounding high noon responsibly. All right, so... We got a lot of football to talk about. Here's the way I think we're going to do this. And Katie, let me just give you a, a kind of an assignment off the top. Uh, certainly not. I'm not telling you. But uh, as bowls come in, if you could just big ones, are, let us aware because I know that Ohio State and Utah will be in the Rose Bowl. Yeah. Uh, and I don't know how many bowls we're aware of right now, but it's the big bowls. You know. I know that there's. I think um, Hawaii and Memphis are in the military bowl. I think. Sure. But so, yeah, I will let you guys know. Anything interesting that comes across your plate, go ahead and uh, send it to us. And, um, you know, the Independence Bowl, the Military Bowl, maybe not, but certainly the Peach Bowl, the Cotton uh, – well, Cotton Bowls. Yeah, are, we're uh, ranked teams, ranked matchups. Sure, sure. Okay, so we have a lot to talk about because we now have a college football playoff. And the way I think we're going to do this, Casey, and if you, if you disagree, let me know now. Let's briefly talk about who the playoff is. Then we'll circle back and talk about yesterday because there's a ton of things that happened yesterday that, that necessitated this. And then we'll, at the end of the podcast, come back to the playoff and kind of see how we think it plays out. Does that make yeah, sense? I, I like that idea. I also think, I know we, we did this last year too. I think that you know if we focus on the really big games today and then on Tuesday's episode, go through all the bowl games. I loved doing that last year. You know, we actually like said exactly how many we care about. But obviously the big news today is the four. Um, I'm watching it on TV right now. You know, Nick Saban's on there looking like he's just not even happy to be there, even though he is. But a lot of things happen, and usually we do this on Saturday night, so we have like double the amount to talk about. 
So we, the playoff is, and if you're listening to this, you already know it, but we will, uh, excuse me, we will go through it. Number one, Alabama, number two, Michigan, number three, Georgia, and number four, for the first time ever, a group of five team has crashed the party. It is, in fact, Cincinnati. Uh, I will just briefly go over it. I think the only arguments here were perhaps Michigan and Alabama. It's hard to separate them for one or two. And maybe Georgia or Cincinnati, maybe there was a um, – there was a, an urge to put Georgia four because of how they looked yesterday. But ultimately, I think we all know the committee just wanted to probably make sure Georgia and Alabama didn't play next game. You know what? I mean, but that's the most obvious thing of all time, right? I mean, everybody with a brain knows that. They rolled out, and I always forget the commissioner. What's his name? Barta. 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 They rolled him out right after they announced the four, and he said, I know that's what everyone thinks, but it has absolutely nothing to do with our thought process. It's like, that is the most bullshit thing ever. Of course it does. They don't want, you don't, it's a money game. You don't want to see Alabama and Georgia in the semis. And he was like, oh no, we didn't think anything about that at all. It's like, yes, you did. And everybody knows that you did. Well, I will say this. I will say this. If Georgia Bama met in the semis and therefore you guarantee that Michigan was in the finals, I think that would be a huge money final too. So there, there is an argument there that like, when you look at Alabama and Michigan, Alabama does have a good argument for number one. When you look at Georgia, Cincinnati, Georgia has a decent argument for number three. So you can, you can believe him at face value and I think be okay. I think there's three teams now that we think can win the national title. I don't know how, how a whole lot of people think that Cincinnati is going to beat Alabama. doesn't mean it's not going to happen, but I, I think there's three teams here for, for a title spot. And, uh, yeah, no matter what you did in the semifinals, I think you've you've got a chance at a at a very interesting final matchup. Yeah, I mean, I again, I know Cincinnati went undefeated and they deserve to be in the playoff now. We see that it finally happened. The way things that you know, in Oklahoma State losing, I think played a big part of that. And I know we'll talk about that game as well. But I don't think that you could make an argument that Cincinnati should be higher than four. Like if you really look at those teams, yes, because they're undefeated and the way Georgia played, and I understand they killed Houston and everything else. But we all know that Cincinnati is the fourth of those teams. There's just no question in my in my head. That being said, I don't hate Cincinnati's matchup with Alabama. I don't hate it. I don't hate it. We'll get to that later. I don't hate it. I don't love it, but I don't hate it. I mean, don't, don't do it to yourself yet. You got. No, but with, with John Mechie getting hurt and Alabama having one elite receiver, since he has one elite cornerback, like is he of, is he a hundred percent out though? I think. Yeah. Uh, it just came through. Saban says they haven't necessarily determined what it is, but it looks very serious. He tore his right. ACL. Yeah, it looks like an ACL. Yeah. So, um, no, but they have again, they have these witch doctors, and we've got a month. So, no, yeah, all right. So, playing. so there's the uh, there's the playoff, and we will circle back to it and talk about it. But first, we got to talk about what happened on Saturday to get us to this point. Um, and I think the, the headline stealer here is, in fact, Alabama's performance in the SEC championship game. So that's the opportunity to go ahead and say publicly, listen, I said in August, I doubled down, I tripled down that Alabama wasn't going to make the playoff. They are making the playoff. They won the SEC. Uh, I, was, I was wrong about Alabama. That's, that's clear. That's obvious. That can't be disputed. That being said, where did this come from? Where, where did, how did they play the way they did against Auburn? How did they play the way they did against Arkansas? How did they play the way they did the last month of the season and do this to Georgia? Like, it really, it, it, it really does some preconceived notions, some, some ideas about Alabama. If you just get saved in the title game, he's going to win it. If you just get Kirby Smart to a big game against Alabama, he's going to lose it. Like, I could have seen an argument for Alabama winning this game. I did not see them coming out and absolutely steamrolling George. What you just said is why it doesn't make any sense, but it makes perfect sense. Kirby smart cannot beat Nick Saban. He just can't do it. And you are, I mean, and I know all season you were very, very high on Georgia as you should have been. And you were low on Alabama and a lot of different spots. I mean, a and beat Alabama. a and is not a great team this year. However, there's just something about, this hump that Kirby Smart cannot get over. And you're saying, like, not only did they beat them, they kicked the shit out of them yesterday. That didn't even look like the same team. You know what's I, weird about it, though? Go ahead, Jack. I don't think they kicked the shit out of them. I just – I know what you guys are saying. And, like, I also – you know, we'll get to the playoff later. But – Don't 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 steal my take. Don't steal it. Don't steal it. Don't I, steal like – No, you guys, uh, you guys can't actually believe that. Oh, yeah. yeah oh, 100%. I 100% believe it. You think Georgia purposely lost that game? No, 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 no. I think I, we both believe Georgia's going to win the national title. 
Yeah, and like, I mean, that being said, I mean, looking at what that game, like the game, they ended up losing by 17. Yeah. That's embedded through two really big, th- or even maybe three big interceptions. Georgia got into the red zone twice and came away with zero points in those two instances. There was like, I mean, that pass that's embedded through to um, Bowers in the in the end zone. If he caught that, it's a completely different game. It was a perfect pass. I just think it's there. That seventeen point differential is more like four. It was like four to seven yesterday, and Alabama had all the motivation in the world for that game. That's fine. But I, I mean, to, to for the number one team in the country and it to be the undeniable number one team in the country. And like, I mean, I, I know on the college football show, I put Michigan up there with, with Brandon was furious with me about. Um, but like to, to lose in the SEC championship by 17 points to a team that barely won a lot of games is getting the shit kicked out of you. No, I, I, I don't know. That's the truth somewhere in the middle there. I, but I, you know when the game changed? You know when the game ended? I'll tell you exactly when the game ended. When you picked them? Why would you do this? I'm kidding. What? I, okay. I'm kidding. All right. The game ended when Georgia scored with three minutes to go, two minutes to go in the first half, and then Alabama comes down the field, and Bryce Young fumbles the football at the 25-yard line. He fumbles the football, and Georgia has four guys around it. Alabama has Bryce Young. Bryce Young hoovers it up and gets it back and, and recovers it. They go on and score a touchdown. If they don't score a touchdown there and it's tied at halftime – then Alabama comes out. Even if they score at the beginning, they're down. They're up seven. They're not up fourteen. They were able to score coming, going in, and coming out of the locker room. Now it's a fourteen point game. All of a sudden, Stetson Bennett's pressing, and that leads to the blowout. Georgia was also up ten nothing in this game at one point. Like Georgia, for it's not like they didn't come ready to play. They came ready to play. Alabama hit them with that long play with Jamison Williams, and Georgia freaked the fuck out. And maybe that's a maybe maybe that is a product of the coach, but I think I got a better way of saying what Jack said. I don't know if they beat the shit out of him yesterday, but I do not believe Alabama is 17 points better than Georgia. I don't believe that. Yesterday, the scoreboard said that, but I don't believe that. Well, and, and you guys have both just said it. There are multiple things that fell Alabama's way that if they didn't, things would look different. That's, I mean, that's every football game. The thing, you I mean, you just said it. The poise was so different. I don't know if it is if it is a product of playing for Kirby Smart versus playing for Nick Saban. But even in the Iron Bowl, when, you know, they couldn't score for shit for three quarters and then down the stretch of that game, Bryce Young looks completely posed here, poised. He never starts to freak out. That's what you saw from Alabama yesterday, and it's not what you saw from Georgia. So I don't know if they're 17 points better, but they definitely play like they're a lot more scared of Alabama than vice versa. And it could be a product of Georgia. I mean, they didn't, ha- they didn't have a close game for the last three months. They didn't have a close game. They had nobody stand up to them, and as soon as it happened, they just they shit the bed, and maybe a month will do them good. You know how like when uh, they always say like dogs or horses can sense if you're scared of them or not? Right. That's the I way think, I feel. Huh? I think it's uh, dogs and bees. Bees. Dogs and bees. And horses too, right? I don't think it's horses. I think it's dogs and bees. Well, whatever. You know I'm what I'm by the little kid from Jerry Maguire. You, did you know dogs and bees can smell fear? I forgot about that quote. That's a good quote. I like yeah. that. I haven't watched I need to watch that movie again. I haven't seen it in a hot minute. Casey, I watched it the other day. It it holds up so it's, well. I mean, it people who say that it doesn't hold up are just clowns. I need it, to watch it. That's what I need to do. Wonderful. I'm, it's wonderful. Go ahead. So good. But you're right. They can so it's like almost like not only can Nick Saban smell the fear on Kirby Smart? It's like the whole team could smell the fear too, because it really like when they got when they went up by ten points, like all right, here we go. As soon as Alabama got a double digit lead, I don't know how y'all felt. There was zero doubt in my mind that Georgia was coming back. They, there's, there was no way they were going to overcome that deficit because once Nick Saban gets up that way against somebody that just does fear him, whether he'll ever admit it or not, like that game was Alabama's from that moment on. A couple of things from this game, a. Jamison Williams is one of the more breathtaking athletes I've seen in a very long time. Mm-hmm. That that play across the middle and then him turning it into an 80-yard touchdown showed speed that we don't see very often. That was that was something. And no matter how good or bad of a season Alabama may have, they're still going to take the field on Saturday with guys that can do that. So that that was that was impressive. Hi, boys and girls. It's about waking up. It's about what you have to do. It's Christmas season, right? You don't want to be sleeping through the the malls. You don't want to be uh, falling down on the job. You got to get going. Coffee. 
Coffee is what helps you. And we at Barstool, we deal and we drink the best coffee in America. It's a veteran-owned coffee company called Black Rifle Coffee. Jack, you're a coffee guy. I love coffee. It's part of my daily routine. And I got to say, when I need an extra pep in my step, Black Rifle is right there. Black Rifle Coffee, coffee, once again, a veteran-owned coffee company serving premium coffee to people who love America. And trust me, Jack loves America. I love Love. America. Katie, she might be on the fence. I'm not sure. But their veteran CEO and founder, Evan Hafer, spent over seven years on the ground overseas with special forces. And as a CIA contractor, this dude sounds like a badass, by the way. As a CIA contractor, Evan even modified the gun trucks during the invasion of Iraq to ground coffee anywhere. That is a true badass. That guy's at war, and he's changing the truck so they can grind coffee. Okay. I mean, that man is a badass and loves his coffee. I'll tell you that much. If you trust anybody with your coffee, it should be that guy who's like, I don't care about the bullets that might be coming. We're going to have some fresh roast. Uh, They import their high-quality coffee beans from all over the world, roast five days a week at their facilities in Manchester, Tennessee, and Salt Lake City, Utah. The team at Black Rifle Coffee continually researching and experimenting with new roasting methods and coffee origins. And the best way to enjoy their Black Rifle Coffee, Jack, you know what it is? It's to join their coffee club. I've heard about this coffee club. You pick the perfect roast, how much and when you want delivered to your door, and they take care of the rest. It's free to sign up and you get free shipping, discounts on partner brands, and early access to new products and club exclusive products. Go to blackriflecoffee.com slash, anybody want to guess? Walker. W-A-L-K-E-R, my name, heart and soul. Use code Walker today and get the freshest coffee in America. Again, blackriflecoffee.com slash Walker. Use code Walker and get the freshest coffee in America sent right to you. Um, the Heisman Trophy was won, was finished off yesterday. That was uh, – by the by halftime of that game, the Heisman Trophy engraver could have gotten started. Bryce Young eviscerated, eviscerated a Georgia defense that was giving up 6.9 yards, uh, 6.9 points a game, 238 yards a game. He had that by halftime. Bryce Young is the Heisman winner, and I will give you my top five uh, that I think it will finish in just a minute. Um, the the- – I feel like because, and we talked about this last week too, it's like because he was the front runner going into this weekend, he absolutely destroyed their defense, but he was also the front runner who was playing yesterday. So it was right, like- But, but I, I think, I, I really believe if Bryce Young comes out and they lose 21 to seven, he doesn't play well. I think Kenny Pickett won the Heisman last night. Yeah. But, yeah. but, but exactly he, that. you know, he didn't have the chance because Bryce Young had already sewn it up. And I think Kenny Pickett finished up second last night. Like that, we always talk about Heisman plays, Heisman highlights. That fake that fake slide would have been a perfect Heisman moment. I the first time I watched it, like when it was live, I didn't notice it. And then he obviously the broadcaster started freaking out, and I went immediately to Twitter to watch it. Like that was perfection. Like, does he practice that, or was that just in the moment? I'm I probably a little bit of both. I, I would bet I, he's probably thought about it. He's probably thought about it before. Like, oh, if I ever get the chance to do this, I'm going to do it. Um, but we like to ruin things as college football analysts and fans and everything. And this morning has been just full of tweets saying this shouldn't be legal. This will be off the books soon. Like, just enjoy it for one fucking time. Just enjoy the moment. Uh, but what's an actual argument of why he shouldn't be able to do that? Well, because the defensive players did check up because they, he was sliding. And that's what you taught. That's what you teach defensive players to do. That's what defensive players are expected to do to protect quarterbacks. And if he took advantage of that. So I can see the argument, but let's just enjoy it one time. Yeah, no, I, I I see it, sure, rationally, but it was really fucking cool, and I'd like to see it happen more often. Yeah, but the next time, if a if a quarterback slide does slide and a defender um, takes his head off, yeah, that's true. I guess it is pretty dangerous, but it was cool to watch in the moment. Nothing bad happened. Back to um, back to Alabama and 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 Georgia. I still just can't fathom where that came from from Alabama. This is this was a team that didn't look great a lot of the year. This was a team. But they walked into that that environment, that championship environment, and just something happened to them, man. Something happened they've, to them. But they've been there before. They that that's that is it's it's the Nick Saban, Bill Belichick curse that no I mean no one. It's like they've been there so many times, and I know it's different in college versus pros because they're kids. But it's like when you play for the greatest college coach of all time, and you have the talent that you do, those moments don't scare you. Was yesterday more about Alabama or more about Georgia though? Well, I guess it would depend on who, what side you're on of it. Like, I mean, I, to me, it's like I, I took Georgia on the college football show because I was a, a 
sheep and I followed around. But I mean, I took Alabama money line a few weeks ago because I was like, I just, there's something weird about this to me. What it said was, is that Georgia is not as good. Uh, he, they're not leaps and bounds above everybody else. Like we thought they were, which I had already started to come around with Michigan after the way they beat Ohio state. What you said to start the podcast, those are the, those three teams are all to me right now on equal playing field going into the playoff. I no disrespect to Cincinnati. I don't see them beating Alabama, but it told me more that we were giving Georgia more credit than we should have. I still believe the credit we gave Georgia was earned and the credit we gave Georgia was, was, was right. Um, and I also still believe Georgia is probably the best team in the country today. I think they're embarrassed right now. I think they got exposed and their defense believed whatever they were doing could just continue. Something was off with their defense yesterday. Their blitzes weren't urgent. Their blitzers were like stopping in the middle of their, of their blitz patterns. Uh, you had guys in the defensive backfield arguing like something was off with Georgia yesterday. I think they're going to use this month and get a lot better. And I think you'll see a different team against Michigan. It's also a much better matchup for them against Michigan. Frankly, it's a fine matchup for Michigan too. It's going to be a low scoring defensive battle. Uh, it's a fascinating playoff game. It is. But, it's a, I'm excited. About it. But also, like, you know, we've talked about how good Georgia's defense is. And, yes, of course, they have weapons. But, I mean, Stetson Bennett, it's like – that. uh-oh. No, that's that's the next point. That's the next Oh, yeah. Like, it's he's not the, a national championship winning quarterback to me. Do they have – do they use the next month to get JT Daniels ready for the playoff? I feel like you have to. I mean, you look at the way that Michigan's defense has been playing all year, especially the last few weeks. And you know that like what, what we saw yesterday, Alabama's defense able to do to Georgia. I mean, I think you all four of us would agree. Michigan's defense is better than Alabama's defense thus far. I mean, Aiden Hutchinson, I mean, I would love to give him the Heisman trophy at this point. Like I understand it's oh. a Bryce Young award, but like they're going to need to do something on offense if they're going to be, if they want to play better than they did yesterday. It's actually a great, a great, uh, thing to look up there. I think Alabama's defense is shockingly statistically a lot better than it, it seemed through the year. I think they were seventh in total defense going into the conference title games. I believe Michigan's probably like fourth or fifth. So they're, they're, they're close. Um, but Michigan has been an elite defense all year, whereas Alabama's had a couple moments where they haven't been. Um, well, so mean, Michigan, what's that? Michigan did allow 40, what, 41 points to Michigan 37, State. 37 to Michigan state. Yeah. I, they, yeah. There, there's been some moments, um, that's why I'm just pulling it up right now on cfbstats.com, which is my my Bible. I, I that's the one I like to use. Um, I I really I listen. Stetson Bennett did a great job all year, and Stetson Bennett is a fine player, and I'm sure he pays his taxes and he's a good American. What happened to Stetson Bennett yesterday? I believe he could win a game against Michigan. I think he could. When it turned into a shootout, though, when it turned into a shootout. Georgia didn't have the quarterback or the receivers, and I don't think George Pickens is quite there yet. I don't think – maybe in a month they will be. I don't think Georgia had the weapons to win a shootout. And and Stetson Bennett, when he started pressing, he threw that pick six, the ball game was over. And I think he's better than what he showed yesterday. But if you've got – if you've got multiple five stars at every single position like Kirby has, and you're rolling with a walk-on quarterback, sometimes you're going to have walk-on problems. And he, he did look a little overmatched at times in that game yesterday. And you have a five-star quarterback over there who's – He's going to be fresh as hell. Now you got a month to get him ready. I think JT Daniel starts against Michigan. I mean, that would make complete sense. And it is either, like you said, him pressing and, and just trying to chase when they went down by two scores. It was like, this, this is, this guy has been great. He's been really good for them all year. These are not the moments that you put a ton of confidence in a guy like Setson Bennett. And that's, I mean, there's not a lot of people that you would anyways, but it was a very clear difference between Bryce Young and Setson Bennett yesterday, who is more poised to be a better quarterback in those situations. And if JT Daniels, who's been just chilling for a while and he has another month to get ready, and these teams haven't seen JT Daniels in a long time, like that's a wrinkle that teams don't necessarily know how to prepare for because they haven't seen it in a couple months. Uh, total defense, Alabama's better. Uh, they're six, Michigan's eight. Scoring defense is where Michigan's elite. They're fourth in the country at 16 points a game. Alabama's uh, giving up 20 points a game. So um, very similar defense. Um, yeah, so so there you go. You've, you've got now uh, – and people people like laughed at me yesterday. People people did all these things, and that's fine. I, I spent a year – if you're going to spend a year building on a take, you got to be ready to catch it when it goes wrong. But the people laughing – Y'all realize we just might be heading toward the SEC championship game again. Yeah, I, I liked that tweet that you when you said it. You're like all these people that are like talking shit realize we're 
we might see this again. Like we might, you know, this is, this is not a bad thing for the SEC. I did. I, I was laughing at the, as I do believe that most people were joking tongue in cheek, but there yeah. were definitely like a facet of people out there that, you know, on Twitter, they're like, Oh, this is on purpose to get the SEC to have two teams. It's like, no, it's not. Jordan didn't fucking lose on purpose, but we could very easily see this again. I mean, I, I don't, I think Michigan's going to beat Georgia, but it's not out of the realm of possibility when there's only four teams and two of no, them. Have two, teams. I, I personally, I looked it up this morning. You know, Alabama's minus one thirty-five, or Alabama's minus one twenty to win it all. Georgia's plus one thirty-five. Michigan's plus four fifty, and Cincinnati's back there. Um, I think <laughs> Georgia. I think Georgia's going to win the national title. I, I, I think Georgia. Georgia is embarrassed, and this is the most important month of Kirby Smart's coaching life. He mm-hmm. has built this roster. He's gotten to this point. Yesterday, he could have killed the monster. He didn't. The monster killed him. But this ain't the end of the movie. Sometimes before the final battle, you take a loss and you have one of your guys, uh, you, you lose an awful lot of good men out there. But in the end, in the end, you're able to triumph and come back. This is not the end of the movie for Georgia and people are acting like it is. No, I mean, it, it would be a hell of an ending. I mean, you know, again, we, I, I, this, this season, even though today was very anticlimactic, I mean, I think we, there was no drama and who was going to be uh, in the playoff because mostly I believe Oklahoma State uh, losing and then Alabama. We knew that both Alabama and Georgia were going to be in, but this year has been full of parity. We've talked about it week in and week out and just that Georgia going undefeated and winning the national title just didn't feel realistic because of how weird everything was. You're right. Like what, one hell of a story for Kirby smart. If he does lose the sec championship the way that he did, and then ends up in the national title and beats Nick Saban beats the big bad Goliath. I don't think that's going to happen because I think it's going to be Michigan, Alabama, but either way, you're right. The story's not done. We, um, for a year that had such parity and such high hopes for chaos, we just might end up with Alabama, Georgia again. Um, but we do have half, half an old school playoff and half a new school, like Michigan, Cincinnati are two newcomers here, Michigan, an all time elite program that is getting back on its feet and Cincinnati, the party crasher. So, so you've got like half a traditional playoff and half a, uh, a brand new playoff. Um, we'll transition off the sec right now. And then let's talk about Michigan. So Michigan is the number two seed. And Michigan, to me, whatever takes were had about Michigan in September and October don't matter at all anymore because we do act like teams don't evolve in college football, and they do. This is not the same. Even even though they were good and even though they were winning, even though they're 7-0, the 7-0 team and this team, completely different. This is not the same Michigan team from a month ago. Well, and I think you said it right after the Michigan State game, but them losing that game – probably did them a lot of favors moving forward because had they beaten Michigan state and then kind of not that they would ever have taken their foot off the gas, but it was like they had every single game mattered so fucking much that that Ohio state game had, if they were undefeated going into it, you know, it might've looked a little bit different, but they were pissed off because they got embarrassed by quote little brother. And this team, not only have they really evolved, you're seeing Jim Harbaugh finally get over this hump that no one thought he could. You know, he's on ESPN today looking happy as shit. I'm like, yeah, because everyone's talking about firing Jim Harbaugh a year ago, and now he's the number two seed in the country. Like, this, this is a completely different program than we've seen in the last few years. When they went to Penn State after the Michigan State came, and it was a tight game, they were trailing in the fourth quarter, they hit the tight end for the long touchdown and won that game. Since then, I believe, they put up 59 against Maryland. What was it? 42 against Ohio State, and then 42 last night against Iowa. And they've given up hardly anything. Um, they are different. Th- th- this is the best version of their team. They're rolling into the playoff, and I'm almost like, boy, a month off probably hurts them more than anybody else because I think they've got the best rhythm of anybody in the country right now. But that's just that's that's what you sign up for when you talk about the playoff. One more thing about the Big Ten. I don't care what their record is. I'll get yeah. You check. Uh, I don't care what their record is. I don't care if they go undefeated. Iowa can't be in championship games anymore. They, I can't watch Iowa in big games. Brandon, go off, King, because I, we both said this a few weeks ago before we knew, before we knew that Wisconsin was not was going to shit the bed. And I said, and you agreed. I think I was the one who said it in a in a worse. I said it would be a travesty if we had to watch Iowa in the Big Ten Championship. And the Iowa fans coming at me like, oh, why would it be a travesty these kids? Like, did you guys watch that game last night? That was boring as shit. I was like, I, I mean, I was in a Michigan bar and they would celebrate, you know, every couple of minutes because Michigan would score. And then everybody would just go back to playing pool and talking because it was so boring. Iowa, 
Iowa at some point over the last 10 years discovered the quarterback uh, fake handoff and roll out to the to the near side of the field with a fullback and tight end running cross. Spider 2 Y banana is what John Gruden called it. They discovered that pass some years ago, and they ran it 94 times last night against Michigan. It never worked. Jack, you have a point. Michigan beat Wisconsin by 21 points earlier in the season. Yeah. So, like, let's not forget that either. It's not no, like that, like – but we did say that, I mean, teams are different by the end of the season. And I, I believe if you look at where Iowa was at the end of the season versus the way Wisconsin was playing, I think Wisconsin no, would no, no. I, 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 Hold on, hold on, time out. Iowa deserved to be there and should have been in the game, period. They were a better team than Wisconsin. What I'm saying is just from a aesthetic point of view, I can't watch Iowa play important games anymore. That was I'm just making a joke. I'm not really being serious here. I mean – but do you think now, like if you look back and I, and I understand Wisconsin lost to Minnesota for the ax, I still think Wisconsin would have been a better game than what we saw last night. Last maybe, night was- but maybe, but Wisconsin or- should, well, maybe, but Wisconsin should beat Minnesota. Wisconsin, well, I, every well, I, opportunity. I would deserve to be there because of the way things that shook out. But if I was going to sit here and say what I, who I think would have been a better matchup for Michigan last night, it was not Iowa. I mean, Iowa, they shouldn't have even been on the same field. I don't think I don't think there's anybody in the West that would have given them a good game last night. I think they would have killed Wisconsin too. Like they, they went to Wisconsin and, and treated them like bitches. Yeah. Jack's right. Um, but but I, mean, I think Michigan is just the best team in the Big Ten by a significant margin at this point in history. Uh, I, I I don't I mean they beat Ohio State by 15 last week. Whoever showed up in Indy was gonna get beat last night. My my little joke is just Iowa just is just an awful team to watch play football. Yeah, um, well, you also don't like Iowa, so that's, that's fair. True. I, I don't like Iowa. Did you see the video that Dave put up where Trent was talking oh, to Trent? Yeah. So funny. Like, and I love Trent. I think Trent is amazing, and he's so nice, whatever, but it is so funny. It's like just everybody that is an Iowa fan looks the same. I just I – got a, I got a beef with one of those people that went, and I, I'll have that on Pick Central tomorrow. Oh, you can't bury the lead there. I want to know. Well, I mean – Big Ev is an Ohio State fan, and Michigan embarrassed Ohio State last week. And it wasn't his choice to go; they made him go. But he just shows up in Indy, bets on Michigan, and is in the stands rooting for his arch rival. That you can't do that. Yeah, you can't do that. But then again, I mean, what what can you do if you're up against Dave in that moment? Just I, think, not- I got a wild take. Why don't people just embrace being against Dave? Why don't they have to? No, like, no, I mean, like, wait, he, he he wasn't going to be able to root for Iowa. He could have. Well, that would be dumb. That would be dumb. If you bet on oh, Iowa. That would be, it'd be funny. But I, would, it would have been dumb. Why? You thought Iowa had a chance to beat Michigan yesterday? I, I don't know. I'm just saying it would have been funny if he embraced the Iowa thing. Yeah, well, but, but then now, yes, it would have been funny if the game wasn't what it turned out to be. But, I mean, if you, especially because he is a big gambler. So it's like, well, I mean, Michigan was the, the very easy play there. Um, Cincinnati. Cincinnati is in, and Jack, Katie, everybody, I would like for your take on this. Cincinnati has broken the door down for the um, the group of five. I don't know if this is repeatable, though. I don't know if it's repeatable, and I, I'll tell you why. Because Cincinnati getting into this year's playoff is not the result of one season. It's the result of two seasons. It's the result of last year, too. It's the result of them going undefeated and being in the mix – And then bringing back so much of that team that they preseason were top eight, nine in the country. It's hard for a group of five team to put together those two back-to-back years of of solid respect. They were also able, and this was just the hand of God coming down, they were able to schedule what ended up being the number five team in the country and beat them at their place. That, that, the fact that Notre Dame lost to them and then Notre Dame's schedule allowed them to finish 11-1 and Two huge, huge factors that might make this a a once-in-a-lifetime thing for a group of five teams getting into the 14 playoff. I hope I hope that the 14 playoff goes the way of the Dodo Bird soon. We have a 12-team playoff anyway. But what Cincinnati did, and and I don't think there can be anybody in the world, I don't think there's any doubt Cincinnati deserves to be one of these four playoff teams. I agree with you. And they actually, I think it was, it was either David Pollock or Joey Galloway saying that, you know, that they they're bitching last year 
you know, that they were just a small part of a big group bitching that Cincinnati didn't get an opportunity to get in. And, you know, UCF a few years ago when they said that they won the national title and then they came out and didn't have as good of a year, it is 1000% correct that at at Cincinnati not put back to back seasons, they would not, we wouldn't see it happen, but they had no choice to put to put them in. Because even if you think Notre Dame would beat them now, they beat them head to head. There's no choice. There's no argument to me of why you wouldn't put Cincinnati in other than the fact that they are group of five, but aren't we talking about the expansion like next year? Is that, is that off the table? Well, we're still talking about it and we're always talking about it until it happens. So I don't know. You hear these like all the mocks though. They look, they look so beautiful. Like what it would be like if it was today. Oh, I guarantee you there's not a team in the country. And this might be hyperbole because Alabama wouldn't be scared of them, but I wouldn't want to play Baylor right now. Baylor did try to give that game away yesterday. Still wouldn't want to play them. I wouldn't want to play Baylor. I hell, I wouldn't want to play Oklahoma State for that matter. Like there's there's certain teams out there I just wouldn't want to play. Um, I think I think uh, it's a hundred percent repeatable. Like it it probably happens once every five years. But yeah. if Houston went undefeated with their schedule when they beat Oklahoma, Oklahoma made the playoffs that year, yeah. um, and Houston won that game. So you could have seen you could have seen uh, Houston do that. Obviously, you need some things to break their way. Uh, because a billion things broke their way. The scheduling is the hardest part because in college basketball, you can schedule games for that year. Right. College football, you need to schedule it like five years in advance, and they got lucky for sure. That's what needs to happen for the G5. But, I mean, let's not forget we're like a year or two removed from uh, like a very common take being, hey, there's no way a G5 team will ever make it. And now a G5 team's in, and now we're thinking, oh, it won't happen again. It, if it stays at four, it's possible. It's tough, but it needs – there's so many things that need to break right. And then, I mean, everything breaks right, and then you go into the playoffs and you're a 13-and-a-half-point underdog. It's like – I mean, Jack, not only are we a few years removed, I said it this summer that I didn't think that there was a way a, a group of five team could make it. And you weren't it. necessarily wrong. It's – you need so many things to break right. I think it happens once every five years. And you're right about that. Like, you just – it's and Brandon's point is 100 percent right. You just need it like the schedule to break your way perfectly because and maybe this goes to how we need to change scheduling. Um, and that's more of an offseason topic. But in scheduling, like maybe that UCF team that came back in 2018, or I think it was after they faked their national championship, <laughs> if it would have been better. And you have to take chances, too, because no program wants to give away home games. Right. Cincinnati did that with Indiana and Notre Dame and you have to be okay with it because the power five, like we saw what Florida did with UCF, they bully you. And that's because they're powerful and you're not. So. All right. So Jack, I'm going to ask you this. Um, Can Cincinnati compete with Alabama? I think they can. I mean, so like it goes back to kind of like what Casey was saying about the Iowa game. It's like, there's a scenario here that Alabama wins 48 to 14, 48 to 10. There is a scenario that Alabama comes out flat and Sauce Gardner shuts that, and like that Mechie injury is big. big. And but at the end of the day, I think what we saw yesterday with Georgia and Alabama is like Bama did, didn't have the great the greatest season, but they have they had the talent to go up against Georgia, Cincinnati. Like they need to play the perfect game, and Alabama has to play bad. There's no like. Because if Georgia and Bama both played a perfect game yesterday, it would have been a, co- a close game. Yeah. But in the scenario yesterday, it was Georgia not playing well, and then Bama coming out and saying, "Hey, guys, like we're amazing." So. Well, the only reason I think that is is Alabama took three elite offensive players. Three. They don't have a running back right now. Brian Robinson's hurt. He's not very good. Uh, they have two elite receivers, Mechie Williams, and they have a Heisman Trophy winning quarterback. They took those three elite players and put together a plan that just decimated Georgia. Okay. 33% of that trio will not play anymore this season, we think. If if you're leaning on two, two players, and, and listen, Cincy probably is going to get hammered in this game. If I just had to, but they have an NFL corner in Sauce Gardner who's probably the best defensive back in the country. Mm-hmm. And that matches up pretty good with Jameson Williams. They also have a quarterback who ain't scared of shit. Like with Stetson, whatever he, I don't think Desmond Ritter is going to get rattled easily. I think Desmond Ritter will be fine. And they also have a home run threat at running back. 
Go ahead, Casey. Sorry. No, I no no no. I that I completely agree with you. Like watching Desmond Ritter play, and again, you know, you, you know, Notre Dame was a huge game, but we haven't seen him play on this stage yet because it's quite literally never happened. But he doesn't seem to be the guy that's going to get rattled. I do think you know, and, and I I know that this is a completely different Alabama team. It is it is every single year. There's just so much to be said about just knowing that you've been there before, knowing that your coach has been there before, knowing that this experience of, of going to play for a national title or playing in the semifinal is not new. So Cincinnati deserves to be there. Just on paper, they don't have as good of athletes as Alabama. That's just a simple fact. I mean, that's not me shitting on Cincinnati. That's just the truth. I don't know if they'll be able to stay as calm as we've seen them because this is the biggest game by far in their history. But I do think Desmond Ritter doesn't look like he'd be scared of anything at this point. So maybe I just don't see a world that Alabama loses to Cincinnati. We did. We did see Ritter go into Notre Dame, though. Yeah. Yeah. And and they didn't. And if you recall that game, they started to shit the bed. Notre Dame was coming back. And I I believe they went on like not a long drive, but like they're like, no, we're going to win this game. I think they and. Last year, we can't like downplay that their game against Georgia. It is kind of like it's not the playoff, but it is like kind of it's like it's 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 a decent game. And then, yeah, and then Jerome, you have the Jerome Ford aspect that he did play at Alabama. And then one more uh, element here. One more element here. We are kind of basing the 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 Alabama we're going to see uh, December thirtieth or December thirty first. We're basing that on the Alabama we just saw yesterday. It can't be ignored that they did spend 12 games this season not being that team. They were that team like against Ole Miss, and they were that team against Georgia. But this is a team that laid an egg against Auburn. This is a team that laid an egg against Arkansas. This is a team that laid an egg against Florida. Like, they've got that ability in them. And and we we assume it won't happen in a championship environment. It certainly didn't happen yesterday. But it's in there. It's definitely in there, but that and and but this on the same facet too is it's like we didn't think that Georgia had in them what they did yesterday. I mean, again, I I I say this because I really didn't like it's I'm not trying to like rub it in. Like I said, Alabama was going to be in the playoff. I took Alabama money line, but by the middle of last week, I talked to myself. And you're like, what are you talking about? Like all this like juju. There's no Georgia's just the better team. But like you just wonder if like Al, did that, does it matter how Alabama was beating these teams when they just beat Georgia the way that they did? Like I don't. To, to me, the Alabama that lost to Texas A&M is not the same Alabama from yesterday. Um, all right. So, um, you know what the worst thing in the world is, Jack? Tell me. It's when your penis doesn't work. But you know what the second worst thing in the world is? I think it's debt. More specifically, it's student loan debt. Yes. Student loan debt. I know you're you're one of these big guys who wants to forgive all student loan debt, but until that happens, until that happens, we got companies out there like Ernest who are going to help you with easy, practical ways to attack your student loan debt. You can refinance your student debt at earnest.com slash Barstool. Earnest.com, they know what they're doing. Ernest offers low-rate student loan refinancing, and you can check your rate risk-free in just two minutes. With Ernest, you get radically flexible payments and you can pick your loan term. By refinancing, you can reduce your loan term, save money, or combine multiple loans into a simple monthly payment. And if you have questions, you can even talk to a real live human at Ernest for help. Isn't it time you stop feeling overwhelmed by your student debt? Yes, yes, yes. You need to stop getting overwhelmed. Plus, holiday season, you're accruing like credit card debt. You're, you're taking care of everybody, but take care of yourself. Go to Ernest.com and attack that student loan debt. Do it the right way. Ernest is offering our listeners a $100 cash bonus. Refinance your student debt at earnest.com slash barstool. Terms and conditions apply. I'm not going to do the sexy whisper, but I am going to read this. Visit earnest.com slash barstool for more details. Terms and conditions apply. Earnest student loan refinancing made by Earnest Operations, LLC, NMLS, number 1204917. California financing law license number 6054788. 535 Mission Street in San Francisco, California, 94105. Visit earnest.com slash licenses for a full list of licenses. Um, for some news came through, um, Joe Brady is out at the Panthers. Are we going to see him in college football next year? I think it's a little late for him. I I, I don't know where he would uh, where he would land. Uh, we'll see. We, we, we got some coaching news to talk about for sure. Um, oh, man, I wish he would have gone. If he went back to LSU, that'd be awesome. Well, I mean, there you can't rule. I mean, he could go back there as an offensive coach. It's true. Um, 
All right, so we have to – this has all been happy, right? This has all been great. Alabama's in, Georgia's in, Michigan's in, Cincy's in. Classic Mike Gundy yesterday. Oh. <laughs> Absolutely classic Big 12 title game, which that got the day started. I thought – other than the Michigan-Iowa game, which was a stinker because Michigan just thumped them, uh, I thought it was an incredible day of football, and it got started with a Big 12 title game that was absolutely edge of your seat, heart pounding football, especially for the last quarter of that game. I I differ from people, and, and people believe that Oklahoma State, because they lost yesterday, are, is not a good team. Oklahoma State is a good team. Oklahoma State's a very good team. Oklahoma State lost to a team in a close game, a team they beat by ten earlier. It's hard to beat teams twice. Dave Aran is a very good coach. Baylor also got a lot of bounces. But I want to start this game by this. How did that running back not get that touchdown at the end? I, I, it was, it was like I was seeing things. How the fuck did he not make it in the end zone? How? Now, 42, How? 42 for Baylor is an incredibly fast player, and he tracked him down. Uh, but the way that play was called, it looked like it was called, it, it looked like it was a well called play and was going to be a touchdown. He also, the running back, instead of, going on direct line, he kind of curved a little bit and gave up a little bit of ground. And that little bit of ground was probably the answer to that he needed to get in the end zone. It was very much like Michael Penix against, uh, against Penn state last year. Penix was given the touchdown. This guy didn't quite get there. Um, but f- incredibly thrilling into a college football game. Yeah. And you said, you think it was probably the difference. It was, I think it was absolutely the difference. Had he not just given that little bit of room to be able to get caught. Like, I feel like he would have just waltzed into the end zone. I it's, you know, we talk about Jim Harbaugh getting over the hump and we talk about Cincinnati now getting over the hump for the group of five. Mike Gundy does this too. Mike Gundy, you know, it's like every year, like they would have been in the playoff yesterday. I really believe that had they won. I I, I think it's all conjecture. I think if Oklahoma state wins yesterday, since he's out. I do too. And, and, and that's even before, you know, obviously at the end of the big 12 championship, it was like, well, we don't know what the SEC is going to look like. There was a moment where I was like, holy shit, are we about to see Notre Dame and Cincy in there? If Georgia wins, like, because Mike Gundy played the first game and he had that gigantic moment to be on a national stage and put them into that. It was like, well, Mike Gundy's going to Mike Gundy. And I don't know if that ever changes, but they, they would be playing, they'd, they'd be the number four seed today. And they just couldn't do it. He couldn't get into the end zone. Um, yeah, so I, I, I just, they fell behind and Spencer Sanders, who, who has gotten them to the brink of a playoff, had his worst game as, as a college football player. He tried to fight back. He threw four interceptions. Uh, Baylor had touchdown drives of like 10, 30, 43 yards, uh, and they were able to win the game. I think, uh, you know, I don't want to hate on Gundy because he did get this team. This team was good. I think they're a legit top 10 team. They lost to Baylor. I think this is so much about Dave Aranda. It is so hard to believe LSU, Florida, USC, Oklahoma, all these jobs came open and a guy who walked into Baylor and went two and seven last year because of no talent just won the big 12. And he is two years removed from building a national championship defense and winning a national title as a defensive coordinator. How was Dave Aranda not one of the most coveted names in the country? How was Dave, how is Dave Aranda still at Baylor? That is my question. It's a great question. I, I, I don't know the answer. I don't, I mean, I can tell you right now, Waco's a shithole, no offense. I don't know why he would want to be there. Um, But I guess if you, if you look at it this way, if you think, okay, well, Texas and Oklahoma are going to go to the SEC, uh, you know, it's, it's all kind of in the shift. And if you can make Baylor the program in the big 12, like, I mean, he's, he's got himself in a pretty good, pretty good situation, especially knowing that. Yeah. Hmm? And Casey, to go to your question, well, why was he why was he a defensive coordinator for so long too? Is there like something about him? Like maybe people don't like him. He does have that incredible like incredible stoic right. um, likeness to him. Maybe he's not a likable person, but there's been plenty of coaches that have not been like like your likability depends on one thing at the end of the day, is if you win or not. But right. he was a defensive coordinator for an incredibly long time. Kind of like Venables, who we'll get to. But Maybe he was a defensive coordinator for the money. He was the highest paid DC, but I mean, I don't know. It's like, why was he there for so long? You'd think he would have picked up something. But you look at this world that we're living in. Virginia Tech hired Penn State's defensive coordinator. Oklahoma just hired Penn State's defensive coordinator. And there's 
a longtime defensive coordinator who two years into his first head job just won the, the Big 12. Like, no, you're right. I'm just trying to, like, think of why. Like That's what the only thing. Right. Dave um, Aranda is also one of those guys. I'm going to look it up because Dave Aranda, to me, if you look at him, he could be 32, 42, or 52. I have no idea how old that guy is. I thought about it because Jack's right. He's been in, in the game forever. But then, like, he, there's no – he doesn't emote at all. Like, I don't know. I, I'm gonna, You know what I'm going to guess? I'm going to guess – Yeah, I want everybody to guess Dave Aranda's age. I, I know it now. 39. No, yeah. that would be crazy. Uh, 47. Katie. Um, probably 38. Yeah, okay. Um, Jack went over, but he is the closest. It is 45 years old. He is the only thing is – it's so hard to like get to a big uh, high level in college coaching. Like it's like such a fr like fraternity mindset of like you have to go through the ranks and it takes so long. That's the only reason I guess that is. But his stoicness is crazy. Like that clip of him yesterday. Yeah. Like, I mean, I get like expecting it, but like I think Nick, Nick Saban in those situations goes crazy. Like it's I don't know. It's like some. It's really something. Jack, I have never in my life. I've never in my life seen a coach that nonplussed about a moment like that. He he looks down the line at, at the and he biggest likes play ever for them, the biggest play, and it's a defensive play too. It's his guys. It's his guys that make the defensive play, and it's the stadium erupts, and he just, okay. And then it gets Gatorade poured on him. He doesn't even react to that. I think he's a robot. He, uh, he didn't even, like, smirk a little bit. You know, like when Saban, like, he's trying not to emote at all, but you know that he is, and he has that little tiny smirk. Dave Aranda just like, I mean, he's the might be the best actor of all time. He might be in the wrong profession. But what he, if he's a Terminator? What if he's a Terminator? Can you rule out that he's a Terminator? No. I mean, 100% honestly, a sociopath, though. Damn. That guy's a sociopath. Like, even when but they were like, wins, oh. Yeah. What did you say, Katie? Sorry. He wins, so it doesn't matter. No, it doesn't matter at all. But, but he, like, even when they were like, oh, why did you kick that field goal? He goes, oh, point differential. Like, he doesn't consider the other things. He was like, no, point differential. It's going to matter at the end of the season. Like he, uh, like Lincoln Riley was mad about that because Lincoln Riley is like a real human being that thinks about things. Like Dave Aran is just like, no, point differential. Just, he like, is str like, he's strictly programmed. Yeah, he just like wakes up in the morning. He's like, hmm, what am I going to need to do to, for the point differential? Today? I guarantee he uh, eats how am I this, gonna, to make sure I'm, I have the upper hand there. I guarantee he eats the same food every day. Yeah. And his, his he has a dog named Dog. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, also, he goes home and he just looks at the wall. That's his like <laughs> time off. That's how that's how he that's how he like winds down after a long day. Just stares at a white wall. Yeah, <laughs> uh, he he sleeps in that position too. Just you know, it wakes up, opens his eyes, and then just goes about his day. Um, Young coaches that you mentioned, um, the fact that Marcus Freeman is what thirty five and he escalated quickly. I think this is huge for them. I want to talk about him. We're going to get to coaches. That's on the list after Heisman. I want to do Heisman now, okay? So here's my top five in the Heisman, the way I think it will and should finish, okay? okay. I got number one Heisman. It was won yesterday. Bryce Young will be the Heisman Trophy winner. Alabama will get its second straight Heisman because that program and fan base definitely needs something good to happen to them. Uh, number two, I think Kenny Pickett for Pitt should be, the, should, should be number two. I, I think – Again, had Bryce Young had a normal performance against Georgia and, and not scored a lot of points and gotten beat, I think Kenny Pickett could have won the Heisman last night, but he didn't. Um, three, I think C.J. Stroud hangs in at number three, even though I really feel like if we're looking at it with a uh, – oh, we got to talk about Quinn too. Uh, even though if we look at it with a, uh, a discerning eye, C.J. Stroud was the product of great receivers and running back and everything else. But I think he's number three. Kenneth Walker, the third running back, Michigan State, should be number four. And I give the five spot to Aiden Hutchinson, defensive and Michigan. He was the defensive MVP of the title game yesterday. Will Anderson didn't really do much in the SEC title game. They both ended up with 14, 14 and a half sacks, but Hutchinson had his in bigger games. I got Aiden Hutchinson as the number five Heisman finisher. Jack, you raise your hand. So I think you're right. That's a really good list. I have to say, Will Anderson's stats are insane. They're better than Hutchinson's. I and maybe I would love maybe this week I'll dig into them and see maybe he had like eight sacks against like Campbell or something. But, no, I um, looked at it. I, I looked at it because I wanted to make this point. 
His stats against SEC teams are, are very good. He got really started when he had four sacks against Mississippi State. Um, okay. But he doesn't have – like I was expecting to see maybe in non-conference play he had like seven or eight sacks and it juiced – no, his, his, his stats and Aiden Hutchinson's stats line up conference-wise very similarly. Aiden Hutchinson stacked his sacks against uh, Iowa, Penn State, and Ohio State. He had three each against Penn State and Ohio State. But Will Anderson – and sack stats are very even, but tackles for loss, Will Anderson is is well ahead, and tackles period is well ahead. And we always talk about Sue, and Bama put out this graphic, and maybe it's like uh, – somebody can maybe refute it because it was put out by Alabama. It's propaganda. But, like, he had a better season. I know the game's different, but he – like, we always talk about that Sue season, and he's had just as good of a season. But uh, he, he's like 5A, 5B is, are those two. To me, though, Sue did it from defensive tackle and, and 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 just dominating from the middle of the line. That's so hard to accumulate stats there. And Sue yeah. did it. To me, Sue and was- Hutchinson, I think, has the Heisman isn't like who the best player is necessarily. It's like who's Hutchinson was like the guy for Michigan this year. I don't know if you remember, but remember uh, in the off season we were talking about like storylines, classic storylines. Yeah. Bla- Hutchinson was the guy that said before the season, we weren't bought in last year. We're bought in this season. And we made fun of him on the podcast, which is like fair, but he was right. They were, they like, like, and he's the guy of like, when you think about this Michigan team, you're going to think about Aiden Hutchinson and his mom. It definitely is mom. Definitely. Why is mom? What, what's the, does he got oh, she's just, she's just hot. She's okay. a babe. She's a, she is a babe. I think, I think Jack, I think Jack McGuire is the leading analyst of hot college football moms in this country. Absolutely. And girlfriends. No, he always knows the hot moms. Always. Well, yeah, but Cade, I, Cade McNamara's girlfriend was wearing like this uh, juicy couture set last night. And I did some research and like, yeah, Cade McNamara shot up in my rankings. See, told you. Um, question, uh, Jack, and, and I know they had a 9-3 season. They turned it around. How are the Clemson housewives doing? Well, so it's like there's a there's a lot of speculation because you know Trevor left obviously, but then there's some of some of their boyfriends. They're going to see if they're going to come back or not. They didn't have the best of seasons. They were NFL draft prospects, but maybe they'll have to come back. But then some of them are leaving because they're one of them's a walk on and his time's up. So it's it's there's a lot of drama right now. I think they're saying it's over. A lot of drama. Wow. Jack, Jack truly is. He's, he's a he's a jack of all trades. You know. He, Did you he, see? They they duetted my TikTok about them. Yes. Yes. Yeah. You see, like we and even the the players they did they duetted too. They were like, "This is funny." Yeah. No. I mean, you 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 truly are. You're you're a man of of many talents, Jack. The TMZ, I, the TMZ of college football. Jack, I I don't think that's a bad position to have. Oh. I think that's that's potentially a lucrative position to have. Oh I, no no no! I I love it. I. If you ever need a mate, my thing is who's going to emerge next season. We'll talk about in the off season. I'm always looking for the next real housewives of X. Jack, I like that. By Jack, the way, own recruiting rank. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> People love that shit, especially in the TikTok world. Like that's, they'd rather hear about that than the X's and O's anyways. Yeah. yeah, I will yeah. Say that. Hutchinson went out and got a five star this off season. Yeah. And I will say Jack, I mean, it is something that more, you know, girls and females will keep an eye on too. So it's not a bad way to get your face in front of all the single ladies out there. I'm yeah. Saying. Right. No. Yeah. Correct. You're not wrong. By the way, we haven't mentioned this yet, and I it's on my TV, which was, and I know we've all talked about it on Twitter. What in the fuck is this desk ESPN is using today? I, this is fine. The round desk, whatever. It sounds better than it looks in person. Like, I understand what they're trying. I still can't watch a Fox broadcast without laughing at the fact that they have a <laughs> – they have an 18-minute halftime, and they got six people getting takes They off. added one yesterday with Charles Woodson. They put him in. They're, and they're all his takes – his take, did you see his takes? His takes were like, yeah, we're going to win. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. It was it, – like, you know, last year, and I understand, you know, the six feet thing, it was like the clownishly big desks because they wanted all the space for COVID. It's like basically they decided this year they were just going to do the complete opposite. It is so bad. But, I'm, I mean, this I, – I honestly, I will say, it looks ridiculous – the Fox desk and we make fun of it. This set that they're rolling out today is just awful. Like we're looking yeah. at the back of Jesse Palmer's head. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not great. And, and it's, it, 
it looks like, again, anytime you, you want to do something, you say, let's do a roundtable discussion or let's do a roundtable. Sounds great. Doesn't work good for cameras. No. Um, but back to the Fox thing real quick. My favorite thing to think about with Fox is I like to think they talked to their talent scout and said, all right, we got to have coast to coast representation. Go get the USC guy. And he's like, own it, boss. And he just goes. And then he, about halfway, he's like, wait, which one? Reg, 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 I'll just get them both. And he just, he just got Bush and Leonard. Yeah. They, they, at some point yesterday, whenever they, they went to Bob Stoops, it was like, he didn't know that they were actually coming to him. And I'm like, first of all, you guys have a very, like you said, an 18 minute halftime, it should be pretty segmented out. And they like threw him a question. He was like surprised that they had asked him a question and it was about the playoff. He was like, Oh, you know, like I, I think if Alabama wins, they'll, they'll be in. Like, yeah. No shit, Bob. What are you talking about? <laughs> Reggie Bush had close too. A mid two thousands all star team. Reggie Bush, Brady yep. Quinn, Bob Stoops, and Matt Liner. It's just like a mid two thousands all star team that just didn't make it in the NFL. That's another thing. Brady Quinn and Matt Liner are the exact same person. Yes. So good looking too. Exactly. What? what? No, who's good looking? I was watching the ACC title game last night. Sam Hartman's a, a dashing young man. Uh, yeah. Awesome. <laughs> The, the ACC title game, Hartman had a really bad game. Yeah. Happens. But I don't know if you watched the end of the game. The, Sam Hartman was like like having existential crisis on the bench. Yeah. And ABC couldn't stop zooming in on him. They were like – and RG3 was like, when I – like, when this happens to me, like, I'll, I'll, like, go talk to my coach. Like, get the cameras off the guy. Like, I get it one shot, but they, like, zoomed in on him. Multiple times, it was weird. It's like, let the kid, like, have his five-interception game in peace. Again, though. Hot. Smoking hot. Boy. You know, Glennie was talking about that because uh, he, he said Sam Howell instead of Sam Hartman a couple of weeks ago at the gambling cave. And he was like, I meant Hartman. He was like, but sue me. They're both really good-looking Sams with H names in the ACC. And I was like, oh, I need to go take a look at this kid. And I was like, oh, my God. I feel like a cradle robber. But, boy, is he hot. Are you, Are you just him? realizing this? I didn't. I knew him. I just saw I, it last night for the first time. His face. He's been like that for like two, three years now. Well, I figure he's probably been that for a while. I I knew he was good looking, Katie. I didn't know that my age appropriate attractiveness level for him would go off. You know, sometimes I look. I mean, you're a lot younger than me, but sometimes I look. I'm like, oh, these. You know, these young guys are attractive. Like he's hot. Tired. Sam Hartman. Wired. Aiden Hutchinson. I tell you what, though. Oh, I haven't. I, I don't know what he really looks like outside of his uniform. Uh, I tell you what, ACC had some hot quarterbacks this year. Braxton Burmeister at Virginia Tech was very good looking too. Um, so if Jack Jack's going to do the whole uh, girlfriends thing, I'm just going to do hot dudes. Yeah, you see, Katie and I can't do that because then it would be weird to be like, oh, well, yeah, these these girls are are ranking it. You do it, and then we'll okay it. Yeah, you just give me the list, and I'll read it. Fine. I, I don't know if you saw, I know this is not an NFL podcast, but I don't know if you saw the clownery that came out from Reddit about the, the hottest NFL coaches. It was just an absolute farce. I was so offended. You know where Bill Belichick was? Where? Nine. No oh, offense to Bill. That's just, Cliff Kingsbury was like five. Get out of here. I don't, I don't think NFL coaches are all that, I mean, they're all old. Uh, Matt LaFleur, Sean McVay, Cliff Kingsbury. That's three. Uh, yeah, pretty hot ones though. Okay. Ryan, Flores, not bad, Ryan Flores is really good looking. Okay. All right. Um I don't know how so, we've gotten here, but so uh now let's get to the coach news. Okay. Coach news. I think there are uh there are th two big ones out there right hanging out there right now that haven't really been finished, but they're pretty finished. Uh and then I want to talk about Marcus Freeman in a minute. But um going from Lincoln Riley. If you're Oklahoma, to Brent Venables, it's an interesting it's an interesting move. Like like I, you got Oklahoma, and you're going to go with a defensive coordinator, a guy who's been a top flight, and I mean the probably the best for as far as a decade defensive coordinator in the country. He's been key to that Clemson national title run, but he's also never been a head coach. And you are going to the SEC. You are Oklahoma. You're a top ten program in the country. I don't know. I don't know how I feel about this. It, one part of me says, good, good that they're getting a defensive guy and they're going to try to get toughness and they're going to try to build from the defensive side. That's good. But second part of me is you're really going with a an unproven defensive coordinator in your head job? 
Who else would they have gone and gotten though? Dave Aranda? Yeah, I guess. I guess. But Luke Fickle? I I don't I don't hate it, but I it's I mean the same thing that we were talking about Dave Aranda, like Dave Aranda was a defensive coordinator and went to Baylor and look what he's able to do. And, and Brett Venables has been one of those guys that's been talked about forever too. So like, maybe this is finally the leap and they are going into the sec too. So it's like the, I, it, it makes, it makes more sense to me than some other names that were thrown around. I, I, I don't, I mean, it, they clearly didn't know Lincoln Riley was leaving. That's the way I'm mean, that, that still is a very obvious thing that's happening. Like Lincoln right. Riley just pulled one over because that's not who I would have uh, had expected at all. Now, it's, it'll be interesting to see if he, in fact, is the head guy. And, and 90% looks like it is heading that direction. It's it's just all over but the shouting right now. It'll be interesting to see if Brent Venables is a top flight recruiter or if he was just on Dabo Sweeney's staff and the connections there behind the scenes at Clemson were top flight to get recruits. Now, the connections in Oklahoma are pretty fucking good too. So whoever's there is going to be able to recruit. But it'll be interesting to see how much of his recruiting prowess was due to him or the spot he was in and we'll uh we'll see we'll see so so moving on from that i think the more interesting coaching decision right now is mario cristobal who is currently at oregon who currently who just got his ass kicked by utah again but mario cristobal has been in that conference title mix since he got there he won it last year he didn't win it this year but this is a huge thing that shows the balance of East Coast, West Coast to me. Because if Oregon loses their second straight coach to a down-on-their-luck ACC program trying to get back to where they were, they lost one to Florida State, and I know he had ties there. Now if they lose this one to Miami, and I know he has ties there, Oregon's a I think Oregon's a top 10, 12 program in this country, and they can't keep a coach because they keep going back East. How does that look for the West Coast? Yeah, they, it's like they can't wait. To, it's the opposite of what like Lincoln Riley did, where it's like, I'm going to the West Coast. I'm getting out of the SEC. I'm getting out of the South. I, if I'm Mario Cristobal, I think I would do it too. Like I, I the the pack. I mean, I know Oregon's a great program, a great the like we. No one gives a shit about the Pac-12 right now. Yeah, but I they give us, Oregon fans give a shit though. That's okay. Yes, if you are in the Pac-12, yes. But I'm saying, like, it, like we we just now mentioned the Pac-12 championship game, and we've talked about every other championship game, you know, in detail. Like, whatever. Like, Oregon lost to Utah again. Great. They did it earlier in the season anyways. And it's just like, all right, well, you be in, in Oregon or you want to go to Miami where you have ties and you get to, to potentially, again, I know this is a kind of like an overused term at this point, but the same thing with Lincoln Riley. If you can revive the USC, if you're Mario Cristobal and you can go down there and get Miami on the up and up, they will love you forever. I think there's a there's a probably 20 jobs in the country that if they get the right coach can always win a national title within three to five years. Um, I think Florida State's one of those jobs. I think Miami is one of those jobs. I think you. if you take Miami and you're the right coach and you get the recruits, you can win a national title within three to five years no matter where Miami is in their process. You can do that. I want Lane to be at Miami so bad. Well, it's not going to happen. I want. I it know, too. but I want it. I want it tremendously, but they wanted Cristobal, and I think they. It looks like they might get Cristobal. So, um, I just think it's it's huge for Miami. Oh, also, what do we think about them hiring this guy without firing the other guy first? Well, I guess Katie just sent me this. Manny Diaz is recruiting today. Like he's out. All his what? staff is out there recruiting. Yeah. No. No one at Miami has the balls to be like, "Hey, buddy." Come because home. because they don't they're like a girl that's like like you have like a guy that you're you're with and he's like close to boyfriend material but like you're searching for the next like another guy and that other guy just became single and you're like i don't know he may like we may stay together or no we may like make a thing out of this but if he doesn't work out i'll just stick with him he's like a good second option katie i love to eat have i ever told you that um only once or twice I'm fat is what I'm trying to tell you, but that's just because I don't take care of myself. But when it is time to eat, I am always on the go and I don't like stopping and getting fast food. I don't like making my wife, putting her under a lot of pressure and making her or asking her to create a large uh, meal that takes a lot of time. We're on the go in the Walker family. And because of that, we get HelloFresh sent to us. And I mean, we get HelloFresh sent to us a lot. We get two boxes a month. HelloFresh, if you don't know what it is, it is a meal service that takes the hassle out of going to the grocery store, takes the hassle out of meal planning. It takes the stress out of buying perfect ingredients because HelloFresh is a service that sends you 
freshly made, wonderful ingredients with re recipe cards that you follow that 30 minutes or less, they send you the food, they send you it in neat packaging, and they send you it with the instructions that any idiot can follow. And HelloFresh makes sure you get a clean, healthy, wonderful, easy to make meal every single night. The holidays can be hectic, but HelloFresh helps keep things simple with recipes that cut back on meal prep and clean up so you can spend less time in the kitchen and more quality time with friends and family. They offer 50 menu and market items to choose from every week, including vegetarian, calorie smart, and gourmet options, providing plenty of variety. HelloFresh Market has this season's entertaining cover with options like their holiday cheese and charcuterie board and skinny dip dark chocolate peppermint almonds. Can I read Ooh. that again? Skinny dip dark chocolate peppermint almonds. Hello. Uh, that sounds wonderful. I love HelloFresh. Uh, it really is easy to make. You get the box, you take it out. The ingredients are all fresh. They're healthy and they're good. They are good. Their sloppy joes are elite. Great food. Their pastas are good. It is a perfect, perfect experience. Um, go to HelloFresh.com slash Walker14. And here's what I'm going to do for you. Use code Walker14 at HelloFresh.com for up to 14 free meals and three free gifts. Am I giving you three free gifts? Yes. I'm also giving you two weeks worth of meals. Two weeks, 14. That's ridiculous. Go to HelloFresh.com slash Walker14. Use code Walker14 for up to 14 free meals, three free gifts. There you go. HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. Do we have uh, – I think Mississippi State is going to play Texas Tech in the Liberty Bowl. That's been uh, – that's been the rumor in Starkville. That's Mike Leach against Texas Tech, who he still oh, has yeah, an yeah. outstanding lawsuit against, I believe. Wait, what? Oh, well, he, well, he was fired wrongly because of Craig James's bitch ass son. It, I think uh, they've had that lawsuit going for like ten years. Yeah, uh, remember when he had like a he had like a protest outside Texas Tech's uh, stadium, like like pay make Mike Leach or something. What's the thing with Craig James and hookers? Well, I don't want to get us sued, but there's like, a, like, I think if you wanted to look, look something up on the internet, you would right. find a decent amount of reading material about Craig James potentially. Uh, that was like, like an. Like some hookers died on his right. walk, per se. That, that was like internet 1.0 stuff. That was like one of the yeah. first mov movements of the internet where people just repeated that, repeated, repeated that. Now, I don't have any information if it's true or not. I do know Craig James got Mike Leach fired, though. That is an uh, incontrovertible fact. fact. Yes, that's yeah. fact. Um, and I'm not sure looking back if that was the right move. No, no, I am sure. That was not the right move. No. Um, so Crystal Ball to Miami uh, is, is, is just huge for what it looks like for Oregon. You know, like like – Losing two straight coaches to to Florida teams is just it's just not great because Florida has I mean Oregon has Nike money Oregon and and I know that there's this thought that Lincoln Riley is about to own the West Coast but one team can't own the West Coast there's room for USC and Oregon to both be powers at the same time and frankly I think USC coming back to power is going to help Oregon uh, as they get stronger so um, anyway uh, and then I want to go back to Notre Dame because it happened between our last show and now. Um, Marcus Freeman got the job, and oh, wait a minute! <laughs> oh, glory, glory be heavens to Betsy! I forgot to talk about Brian Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shoot. I it might I be henpecked? Show I uh, show enough. Forgot about Brian Kelly coming down to the old Great South to resurrect and let the South rise again. <laughs> Un. <laughs> real like this man got on an airplane and was all of a sudden born in the deep south for his and just lived there his entire life drinking sweet tea on the porch with grandma i was it was just like what like you know when i go when i go and i'm around my friends from mm. boston you know i'll i'll notice that i sound a little bit more like them or if i go back home to texas he was doing it so egregiously on purpose that it was just like come on man like, it's not like you just like are like a chameleon and you've been drinking around your buddies. Like, you sound like you're purposely trying to sound like an asshole. He was there for a day and he got off the plane sounding like Ben Mintz. <laughs> he, he was there for one day. This is so great for my family. Like, you're from Massachusetts. Yeah. Like, and I, I mean, and, you know, obviously you and I both being from, you know, South and Texas, whatever, like I've heard plenty of accents and they're all fine and good, but you can tell a fake one. 
you can tell when they're not real. And that man, he has, he's not gotten a lot of practice. I also think this is all funny. It's fun and games. This has potential to be a bigger deal than you think, because if that guy tries to walk into Louisiana and Mississippi and Texas living rooms and pulls that shit, that ain't going to work. That, that I promise you, that ain't going to work. You can't put on an act in front of Southern people. If you're from Massachusetts or you're coming from Notre Dame, they're going to see through that. They're going to think you're talking down to them. That's not going to work. Now, what will work is I find it very, very interesting that Notre Dame players and administration seem to be just fine with Brian Kelly leaving. They seem to be just fine with Marcus Freeman taking over. Marcus Freeman walked in. And this is my favorite YouTube uh, phenomenon that we have these days. It used to be scholarship videos, and those are still great. It used to be bowl, bowl announcements like uh, Western Michigan and the Bahamas. But my favorite new YouTube phenomenon in college football is the team finding out the new coach, and it's one of their own. I remember Missouri had a great one a couple of years ago when it was Barry Odom getting introduced and they freaked out. And now Marcus Freeman gets introduced to the Notre Dame players and they freak out. I love seeing just dudes being dudes and welcoming in one of their own. Yeah, I think it's great. And like they, they seem very, very happy. And that's what you want. Like, you know, we talk a lot about players, coaches. And I mean, I, I'm sure we, the media and the people that do stuff like we are, we're not the media, but you know what I mean? Um, like we might play too much into it sometimes and think it means more than it's, it does. But then you see all these programs that like, you know, they love their strength and conditioning coach because they, he is a player's guy. Marcus Freeman seems like he is that guy to them, but they're just happy that he's there. They're embracing him and they're like, whatever, Brian Kelly, go down South and drink your iced tea and sound like an idiot. Oh man. Shucks a mighty guy. Not because the accent's an idiot. Not because of that. I'm not saying he sounds like an idiot trying to recreate the accent. Sweet sassy molasses, boys. It's just good to be y'all's coach. Did you see what Clark Lee said about it? What Clark um, Lee said? The, yeah, he, well, he's like, I'm happy for Brian Kelly and whatnot. But he's, there's a quote that says, adapting his accent will be part of his success. Like Clark Lee was Notre Dame's uh, coordinate, defense coordinator last year, and he's at Nashville. But has he signed a record deal to, to cover Garth Brooks songs? Are they all just doing this Southern shit? Nope. Um, also, uh, before we get out of here, we're going to circle back to the playoff one more time. Baby boy, Quinn Ewers has pieced out of Columbus. This guy, this guy gave up his senior year of high school, went to Columbus, got $1.4 million in NIL money. He is on, he is on commercials in Columbus area today where he made that money and he is now peaced out he's either going to a&m or texas or texas tech frankly i think texas tech very funny option there um he's at texas tech right now he's out there he's visiting there yeah per twitter don't worry this has he'll, potential he'll be in lubbock for a hot second be like ah, i don't know about this but this no. has potential though like I, I hate to bring up any other highly rated recruits like maybe a tate martell or somebody but this guy was like the highest rated recruit ever. He goes to Ohio State, spends a year that he probably shouldn't have been there anyway, and now he'll start his career for real. But I don't feel like Texas A&M is trying to bend over backwards to get him. I don't feel like Texas is trying to bend over backwards to get him. It feels like, I don't know, it, it, certainly not a bust. Certainly, it's too early to say bust, but like, this is just weird. It's yeah. been, what, 24 hours, though, 48 hours since he was officially in the portal? Like, how much can you do in that time that's, like, public? To, to me, though, him? Katie, I, I feel like it's 24 hours or 48 hours since we found out he was transferring. I feel like the people in the know probably knew it for a while. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's what I think. I, I have no evidence. Yeah, no, I just feel like with such short notice, I'm, I'm sure his DMs have blown up and his agent and whatnot. But, like, from a public standpoint, I don't know how much we would be able to see but you also – this also uh, kind of exposes the new world of college football. You're not going to be able to keep a five-star backup anymore. That's just not going to happen. No. Yeah. You don't have well, – they, they can leave. If you're Quinn Ewers, though, like why would you stay? You know, you're, you look well, – you, you see C.J. Stroud. Um, the backup, uh, Jack, uh, something was also, like, amazing. Mm -hmm. um, and they're bringing in another guy this year who's also amazing. If you're oh. Quinn Ewers, I know you're the top recruit. Uh, like possibly ever but if you're at you're thinking you know what why don't i just go back home to texas all three of those programs right now do not have a quarterback uh that looks very good i mean 
A and M's bring in the uh, the Connor kid, what, like whatever his last name is, like Wigman or Weidman or something like that. Yeah, Weidman, and then but he could go A and M, Texas, Texas Tech, and uh, you know I'm sure his goal is like more so to end up in the NFL and either. Also, I think Texas is putting a lot of its eggs in the uh, Arch Manning basket. I, I think they really think they've got a great chance to land Arch Manning this year. Um, all right, so playoff. We'll find out. We'll have our bowl preview, I guess, on Tuesday, which we have. We'll have some internal conversations. I got some scheduling conflicts Tuesday. We're gonna like dance around this. We'll we'll figure that out off off camera. Um, anyway, uh, oh, one more thing. One more thing. One more thing before we go, because I love. If I love nothing else, just know that I love shitting on Dan Wolken. I love it. It's my favorite thing to do. That's your that's your favorite hobby. You, you give me five, my five favorite things, playing video games, fun time with my wife. Shitting on Dan Wolken is way, way up there. Um, Dan Wolken tweeted out today or yesterday, and I believe it was something to the fact that, can you believe, it, it's insane that a year ago we had people talking about firing Jim Harbaugh. Great take. Fantastic take. You're right. You know who a year ago one of the guys writing an article about firing Jim Harbaugh was? Dan Wolken. It was Dan Wolken. Yeah, Dan Wilkins but, said it's clear he will never win big at Michigan. He said that he wrote that a year ago. Yeah, no, he he seems like one of those guys that like honestly believes people don't remember what he says, and he thinks like, oh well, if I say this now, it's going to be fine. It's like Dan, we remember literally everything that you say because everything that you say is stupid. I think I, I've moved from from ple- uh, pleasantly mocking him to laughing at him. Now I think I just outright hate him, and I think that's a problem. Eh. I think I hate Dan Wolken. Healthy hate. Healthy hate's okay every every now. I mean, oh, not I love some good hate. You're not going to do anything about it, so it's but like what, a very wise, wise, good-looking heart and soul man once said, "The most valuable commodity in college football is hope, but the most abundant is what." Katie, first of all, what are you? Who is that? I'm not going to go to effort to make it actual. I'm just talking about how earlier you were saying this podcast is not for your ego. So I'm just going to sit here and just wait for you to finish. Not all oh, shit. Intended. No. Intended. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, we, on another note, we forgot about one big coaching change. Um, Bronco Mendenhall for Virginia. Do you guys have any thoughts? Yeah, that one was that one came out of nowhere. Um I don't know. I don't know that I have thoughts on that. Well, that might be. A, honestly, I don't really. There. Um, what what is still out there and available is is uh, I, I was, Oklahoma hasn't really done it yet. Miami hasn't done it yet. Um, who's still available, Jack? Vir- Virginia is obviously available. Virginia Tech is filled. Washington State is. Open. Washington State filled. I think they're doing from internally. Uh, it came out a few moments ago. Louisiana is going to promote from internally their OC. Um, okay. Though not for their coach uh, coach openings, but Adrian Martinez is in the transfer portal. I think like that's it. best case scenario for him and for Nebraska. Nebraska has to get out from under him. They're a quarterback away from competing this year. I'm eating bacon, by the way. Um, and a, a new environment might help him. I, I saw he was in Manhattan. He was visiting Kansas State. That's interesting. Yeah. Um. All right. And Dylan Gabriel has an official visit with Ole Miss. So he does. But oh god. Are you dying? I don't know if that's a cough or a sneeze or a choke or what. But they I also saw that I think it looks like uh Jeff Levy's gonna go somewhere and not necessarily yeah, I think Jeff Levy's going to Oklahoma. And in fact the 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 rumor I heard yesterday was um was Brent Venables uh as coach. There's a defensive coordinator as well, and then Jeff Levy as offensive coordinator, which that might mean Dylan Gabriel goes to Oklahoma. Anyway, you, we can't predict the transfer portal. It's about to get buck wild crazy out there. Playoff. We have number one Alabama, number two, uh Michigan, number three, Georgia, number four, Cincinnati. I think Cincinnati competes with Alabama more than we think right now. I think Georgia beats Michigan. I think and Casey thinks Michigan beats Georgia. I do believe, I don't know if you believe this, I think that'll be We've often had a lot of bad semifinal games, and Cincinnati Bama has potential to be that. I think, as far as the semifinal goes, this is one of the better matchups I've ever seen. 
Yeah, no, I mean, I, I tweeted it immediately. It said like, feed me Michigan, Georgia. Like the, I, I think Michigan's going to win. And I know we, we obviously have a month to break this whole game down and really get into it and talk about, you know, the different matchups and whatever. My gut says Michigan, but either way, I'm excited because there's so many times, you know, especially like all the college football haters, they're like, oh, like the playoffs always stink. And I think there is a pretty good possibility that Alabama Cincy is one of those games. Georgia and Michigan, just the two names alone make it exciting. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm here for it. And I like that it's the night game because then that way, after we're done with the Arizona bowl, get to watch it. Yeah. Well, you know, what's funny to me is, and I guess it's not funny, but Dave will obviously be with us uh, out in Arizona, but like he, who's more Michigan than him? Nobody. Right. Who's more Miami than him? Nobody. Right. And Michigan will be playing in the college football playoff in Miami. Yeah. <laughs> and, and he'll be out there with us. Yep. That's just just the way the cookie crumbles. I and, and I know I know that he's you know he's barstool above all else, but it is funny to think about. I, I can just see him in the third quarter being like, "All right, well, I gotta go." And he just my, you know, my jets here. It's on, <laughs> it's on a PJ, and he's in Miami by the time they kick off. Um, oh, that's a great one. So I assume we don't know our barstool ball yet. I think maybe. You know, Kent State having lost that uh, that conference championship game. Oh, okay. Casey knows something that I don't know. Wow, that's can't incredible. we also say what it is? Because by the time this comes out, it's going to be announced. No, no, no. We can't say it. Okay, yeah, that was one. Of, yeah. Wait, you guys know? Yeah. That's who I, I was just on the phone with Dan too. Yes. Okay. Well, I don't know. We can tell you after. Yeah, and I also need to. I need to do a video. So. Okay. Well, now I'm texting Dan. Say who is it? Because. That's, we can finish the podcast and tell you. We I understand that. I want to know from him. I want to, I want him to tell me because he's calling Casey. Why ain't he calling well, me? He's calling me. Jen called me because they don't have kids. Yeah, they want they want me to do a, an announcement video. Okay. Here, um, I'll, show you, here you know, I'll show you something that. It's that fine. Works. It's fine. Okay, got it. Okay. Um, Jack, blur that's, that's that. Out. That's a good place to end it, right? We'll talk more about the playoff on Tuesday. We'll talk more about the bowls on Tuesday. I think we got everything out. Jack needs to get this out quickly because I know we got a lot of people uh, waiting for it. I've got DMs saying, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? It's coming. Um, so anything else? I don't think so. Oh. Purdue and Tennessee in the Music City Bowl. Who's that? Purdue and Tennessee in the Music City Bowl, it seems. I actually don't hate that matchup. All right. That's Unnecessary Roughness. <laughs>